the unexpected king as the key to unlock the big picture of the gospel of Matthew. Now, time to go into God's word. So if you have your Bibles or BSF app, please turn with me to gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses from 21 to 22. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 21 to 22. If you, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your positions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Let's pray together before we continue in our lesson. Father God, we thank you for your presence this evening. Lord, now we call to you for help that we might understand your scriptures. Lord, for we also, we have some special concern with this question. What must we do to inherit the eternal life? So, give us the clarity of the gospel. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, Rockefeller was the first billionaire, the only one in the world in 1839. At the age of 53, tragedy struck this gentleman. The best directors in the world told him, that he could not live more than one year since he knew he could not take his money with him. He started giving it away. He did wonderful things with, with this money. He began the University of Chicago and Rockefeller University. He began the Rockefeller Foundation, which is instrumental in the discovery of penicillin. He also made a, pro a profession of faith and help churches and needy people. And attended church every Sunday, even teaching Sunday school class until he died at the age of 97. Today's lesson indicates that there, there are going to be a lot of surprises in the kingdom of God as far as rewards go for the believers who have sacrificed much for the sake of Christ. For more details, let's move into our lesson. Here is our outline, countercultural commitment, that is verses 1 to 15, and second division, countercultural surrender, countercultural commitment, countercultural surrender. Our first verse starts, starts with when Jesus had finished saying these things. This verse repeats. Five times in the Gospel of Matthew, which contains five major discourses. And scholars divide the book of the book of Matthew by these five markers. When Jesus has finished saying these things, he left Galilee. So verse one marks the end of two and a half years of Jesus' public ministry and traveling to Jerusalem where he would be rejected and killed for the, for the redemption of his people. Jesus would return to Galilee only after his resurrection from the dead and went into the region of the Judea to the other side of the Jordan. You see, when going between Galilee and Judea, the Jewish people always would cross over the east side of the Jordan River and travel through Perea. Reason? Jesus, Jews considered Samaritans as a mixed race, as Gentiles. However, this kind of thinking not true of our Lord. John chapter 4, we learn our Lord traveled through Samaria and ministered to the Samaritan women 
at Jacob's well at Sychar. But on this trip, however, the Lord crossed over the Jordan to minister the needs of the people of Perea. And in verse 2, we read, large crowds followed him and he healed them there. As Jesus is traveling, as with most places that he goes, large crowds of people are following him. People want to know and experience his teachings and his miraculous healing. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? In our text, we find Jesus moving towards Jerusalem. A group of Pharisees tested him with a question about divorce. At the time of Christ, divorce was part of the culture in Israel. There are two schools of thoughts about divorce in Israel. One is the strict view. The strict view held that a divorce can, could only be justified because of sexual immorality. And there is a more lenient view. This view held that a divorce could be obtained for just about any reason. But why did the Pharisees ask Jesus about the issue of divorce? The Pharisees thought that they could discredit the Lord with their question about divorce. Because no matter which way the Lord answered the question, some portion of his followers would be antagonized. Thus, his followers would be split. So, how did Jesus answer? Haven't you read? First, he spoke about the biblical ignorance of the scholars. Jesus asked the question, have you not read? Meaning, have you not read the Bible? Friends, this is our problem. We do not read the word of God to find the principles given to us in it to govern every aspect of our lives. At the beginning, the creator made them male and female. Then, instead of answering yes or no, the Lord went back to the creation account and spoke about the time when God instituted marriage in the beginning. So, Jesus is quoting from chapter 1. So, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So, Jesus asks his challengers, if we are going to talk rightly about marriage and divorce, we must start here. God created marriage. So, he is the only one who can tell us what marriage is and how it is supposed to work. Then the Lord added, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will be one flesh. Here, he quoted from Genesis chapter 2. Secondly, marriage is a sacred, a covenant relationship. In marriage, a new relationship is formed. The man and woman leave their respective families and form a new family. It is God who joins them together as one flesh. There is no marriage without God's involvement, remember. Next, in Ephesians, Paul quotes the same verse. That is, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and he will become one flesh. Paul explains how the husband and wife relations reflects the relationship between the, about the Christ and the church. This, and then he says in the second part of verse 32, this is profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. In other words, it is not, it not that Christ and the church are a picture of man. Human marriage is also sacred because it is a picture of this relationship. Verse 6, so they are no longer two, 
but one flesh therefore what god has joined together let no one separate finally this brings to the heart of marriage one wife for life was god's plan for mankind from the beginning we read about the importance of the lifetime commitment in the old testament in the book of malachi chapter 2 the lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her though she is your partner the wife of your marriage covenant the wife of your marriage covenant see this lifetime aspect is emphasized even more when he talks about breaking faith with the wife of your youth in other words you are supposed to keep this covenant of marriage for a lifetime jesus answer was thoroughly convincing but then the pharisees came up with another question this time a more legitimate one in verses 7 we read they asked why then did moses command that a man give his wife a certificate a certificate of divorce and send her away if marriage was created by god as a sacred then why why is there divorce in the old testament the pharisees are referring to moses instructions about divorce in the book of deuteronomy so what was wrong with this question they cited the bible correctly but as usual their interpretation was wrong this was not a command of moses even though pharisees pharisees thought it was in the old testament times a woman was the vulnerability party in the divorce first of all the woman could not divorce her husband only the husband could divorce his wife and once the woman was divorced there was the question of how she was going to support herself and so god gave certain instructions in the old testament in order to protect the women but this does this does not mean that god approved of divorce jesus replied moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts are very hard but it was not this way from the beginning but it was not this way from the beginning once again the lord went back to creation divorce was not in god's original plan why because sin was not in god's original plan and divorce is always the result of sin and he said because of because your hearts were hard he said because your hearts were hard god intends for marriage to be a lifelong union but because of human sinfulness that is hardness of heart there are situations where god permits divorce i tell you that anyone who divorces his wife when jesus says i tell you he is giving us the command of god himself not moses or any other prophets and we better pay more attention here jesus gave one ground for divorce i tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for a sexual immorality any sexual sin which involves a third party destroys the destroys the unity of two created by god in marriage it destroys the one flesh principle which is the heart of marriage but notice in the old testament a man could not divorce his wife for adultery instead the woman would be killed by pelting of stones but here by this ruling jesus do away the death penalty for adultery and allowed a person to divorce why because divorce shatters the picture of the picture god intends to convey through marriage the picture of the love relationship between jesus christ and his church jesus christ and the bride 
that is the church god does not divorce us even when we are unfaithful to him malachi 216 says i hate divorce friends god is much more pleased with reconciliation rather than divorce even when there has been unfaithfulness in the marriage next apostle paul tells us there is one other situation where god permits a where god permits divorce first corinthians 7:15 but if the unbeliever leaves let it be so the desertion is in the case of a person who gets married becomes a believer and then the spouse wants out because of your new allegiance to christ and in both cases the party who was cheated on or the party who was left can remarry but only to a believer friends god cares about your safety and god desires your suffering to end jesus obviously has high standards of marriage and as followers of jesus so should we verse 10 the disciples said to him if this is a situation between a husband and wife it is better not to marry the disciples were shocked by the limitations such teaching resulted in so they concluded it is better not to marry so how did jesus respond to the disciples in verse 11 and 12 we read not everyone can accept his word but only those to whom it has been given jesus was saying not everyone can accept my word on marriage or not everyone can accept your answer that is better not to marry god's word can be received only by those to whom god's grace is given to live in his state of marriage or in the state of celibacy that is singleness then he added for the eunuchs who are born that way and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others and there are those who chose to live like the eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven jesus pointed out there are three types of single people in the world that some are single by choice and others are single by circumstance and those who are using it for the kingdom of heaven friend you see whether married or single god has a plan for our lives so friend if god is calling you to singleness embrace that and live that life of singleness for the kingdom of heaven and the glory of god if god has called you to marriage develop and sustain a marriage that magnifies the love of jesus and displays the glory of god then we are in verse 15 verse 13 then people brought little children to jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them but the disciples rebuked them it seems that the disciples thought that jesus was so important that he did not have time for children however they seem to have forgotten what jesus said in our previous ch- chapter about the kingdom of heaven kingdom of heaven belonging to those who are like children friends consider what we are always called in the scripture we are never called as adults of god we are always called children of god children are dependent and our complete dependence is to be on god alone so this takes to our first principle god is us total commitment god deserves total commitment
counter cultural surrender just just then a man came to jesus and asked teacher what good thing must i do to get eternal life teacher after blessing the children who had been brought to him he and his disciples resumed their journey as they walked along a young man suddenly came running after them who was this man we are told he was very rich and prominent and we were, and we compare the parallel accounts in mark and luke we find that the man was young and he was rich and he was a ruler possibly of a synagogue he certainly was was reverential towards jesus kneeling before him and calling him teacher so the rich man is looking for a way to do something that will make him worthy to inherit the kingdom he certainly comes to the right person for answers but he has some misconceptions about salvation and how a person obtains eternal life and so jesus needs to teach him even he needs to teach us this evening about what it means to follow christ and go to heaven verse 17 why do you ask me about what is good there is only one who is good the first thing jesus needs to teach him is god only good jesus answers his question with another question why do you ask me about what is good when the lord indicated in that only god is good he was not denying that he himself is god or denying his deity no he was testing the man to see if he was willing to acknowledge that jesus was more than just a good man if we want to enter life keep the commandments so next jesus directs his attention to god's commands look in leviticus chapter 5 keep my degrees and laws for the man who obey them will live by them i am the lord so if you want to enter the life keep the commandments jesus words are straight out of the old testament where god said do you want to live do you want to enter life obey the commandments which means then we see the young ruler replies which ones see and quite now jesus sets before him that first he sets forth any gospel not gospel jesus first directs his attention to the god's commandments and take him straight to the law that is the 10 commandments when the young man asked jesus which ones jesus was focused jesus especially focused on the second part the first part of the commandments talk about our relationship to god those are all about how we relate to god from there that's when this what's often called the second table of the law which tells us how we should treat other people so jesus replied you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery you should not steal you should not give false testimony and uh, honor honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself then verse 20 all this i have kept the young man said what do i still lack friend isn't that interesting the young man says to jesus the judge of heaven and earth who is standing right in front of him i have kept the law since i was a little boy obviously this man had not heard jesus 
sermon on the mount where jesus explained that if you are refrain from adultery but you have lust in your heart you have broken the law even if you have never taken a human life if you have been angry without just cause you have broken the law against the murder jesus revealed that the demands of god's law are far deeper than the mere simple word outward obedience that is spelled out here the rich young ruler did not understand he had a superficial understanding of the good he had a superficial understanding of the law next verse 21 if you want to be perfect go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven mosk mark gospel tells us that jesus looking at him loved him jesus was trying to help this man to understand what god requires go sell your possessions give to the poor and you will have the treasures in heaven so jesus saying to the this angry ruler okay you have kept all the law let's start with the number 1 i am the lord by your god you shall not have any gods before me jesus knew that money was this man's god money was this man's idol so jesus does not ask for for a donation but he asks for a total surrender then come follow me it is not the giving away the money that will save him it is the following jesus when the young man heard this he went away sad because he had great wealth friends verse 22 is one of the saddest most ironic verse in the bible he went away sad because he had great wealth this man who ran to jesus now walked away from him in sorrow the young man turned away because money was more important to him than jesus the pearl of great price was standing right in front of him. all the treasures of heaven and earth in the one who was standing before him yet he walked away from him then jesus said to his disciples truly i tell you it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven next again i tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of god jesus takes the largest animal and the smallest of openings and says it is easier for a camel to go through the needle side than for the rich to enter god's kingdom in this connections we read in first timothy chapter 6 those who want to get rich fall into temptation for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves for many griefs there are pitfalls for rich christians as well now we are in verse 25 when the disciples heard this they were greatly astonished and asked who then can be saved jesus looked at the at them and said with man this is impossible but with god all things are possible and in john chapter 14 verse 6 jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so yes it is hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven it is hard for all of us in fact it is impossible apart from god only a god can save and god only saves through jesus and in the final section of our passage which focuses on the cost on the reward of following jesus and here we learn two vital truths that is you must give up everything to follow jesus peter answered him 
we have left everything to follow you what then will there be for us jesus looked at them and said with man this is impossible but with god all things are possible when jesus called the disciples they left their nets and fishing boats tax collector boats and families behind and so when jesus comes along and says follow me friend we have a choice to make which will it be will you choose whatever it is that is keeping you from following jesus or will you choose to follow christ so that is the first thing we learn from this final section we must give up everything to follow jesus next you receive far more from jesus than you give up for jesus jesus said to them truly i tell you at the renewal of all things when the son of man sits on his glorious throne you who you you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life friends here is the best part that the disciples leave everything for jesus and the sit on the thrones with jesus those who sacrifice for christ receive 100 times as much in return hence yes you must give up everything to follow jesus but you receive far more from jesus than you give up for jesus and most important of all when you follow jesus you will inherit eternal life eternal life that's what the rich young man was wanted and that's what this is all about but many who are first will be lost and many who are lost will be first this is one of jesus favorite saying everything gets reversed when it comes to jesus in our present passage the little children who had nothing are welcomed by jesus while the rich man who had everything walks away friends the tragedy in this event was that the only person in the universe who could get the rich young ruler out of bankruptcy and this is the only person in the universe who could pay the debt that the man could not pay was standing right in front of him friends christ pays our debt this is what the gospel is about christ pays for us he purchased he purchased us and he pays our your debt and my debt he gives to us his righteousness which is the only thing that will satisfy the demands of god's law doctrine works the good works that god produces in your life offers assurance of your salvation all that god does in you and through you proves he is at work accomplishing what you could not friend what has god done in your life that validates that you are his child remember we are not saved by our works saved people experience god's work in their lives through his power alone saved people experience god's work in their lives through his power alone so this takes us to the final principle no one who gives up all to follow jesus will ever end up a loser no one who gives up all to follow jesus will ever end up a loser dear beloved jesus kingdom promotes values that are upside down from those of the world only a redeemed heart produces a redeemed life and outward works that honors god those who follow christ 
uphold marriage, value humility, and forsake earthly status or flawed human works as means to earn God's favor. And so, my friend, what is your one thing? What is keeping you from following Jesus today? It could be money, pride, status, fame, or popularity. It could be a specific relationship. It could be a pattern of loving that you are not willing to let go. What are they choosing over Jesus? What is making you walk away sad today rather than embracing Jesus and the free gift of eternal life? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this one more wonderful lesson for our lives and the great truths what you have taught us this evening. Lord, nothing compares to the greatness of knowing you. And thank you for the promise of eternal life for all who follow you. Father, we admit we are beggars. We have no bread. Father, we admit we are debtors. We have no money. But you have poured out a treasure to us through your son and our savior, Jesus. Lord, forgive us. When we value what the world promotes more than we love what we love. And don't ever let us to walk away from you. This we pray in Jesus. Migration name. Amen. 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 Dear friends, class has been dismissed. We are going to meet next week at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Prem. Wonderful. Thank you, Brother Prem.